My name is Tom, yep, lecturer in physical geography and GIS, and I can really go on ad nauseum about NFM, natural flood management. Uh, hopefully most of you on the call have at least heard of natural flood management. Pre a global pandemic, it was really hard not to come across natural flood management in news headlines. It seemed every other week there was NFM, or maybe it was just because I'm dead sad and was always looking for it. Um, but really natural flood management has come on leaps and bounds. Um, and forgive the pun, but there was a real watershed moment with storms Desmond, Eva and Frank back in 2015, um, where there became this big impetus for policymakers and practitioners to really think about natural flood management, nature based solutions. There's a whole etymology and nomenclature around what you can call these things that I'll be touching on later um, that really, um, yeah, really started to become a, a, a big factor in, in sort of public discourse about exploring these measures. And there are lots of natural flood management schemes out there. Um, I worked on one in South Warwickshire, uh, where I um, worked with farmers, landowners, and uh, a very proactive local community group, uh, looking at where you could put these things and then modeling the effects of, of these schemes. And I'll be outlining um, the results from, from my PhD in this talk, as well as drawing on um, lots of other examples as well, um, because, the title of this presentation is rather ambitious, our current understanding and future challenges, and I'm also aware it's rather negative. Um, I, I don't like to finish on, on negative things. Uh, challenges to me and hopefully to most of you that are researchers is actually an opportunity for future research. And again, this is another big part of this talk. Um, I am a very early career researcher. Um, I've been involved in sort of delivering and the applied side of NFM but I'm aware there's a, a fantastic pool of knowledge within CORE regarding nature-based solutions and some of the methods that I'll be referring to within this presentation um, that could maybe help to address some of these um, really interesting evidence gaps that are in absolute dire need um, for addressing in order for natural flood management to be more widely, uh, more widely considered. So anyway, um, first slide, you can see um, some lengths of timber uh, this is from Pickering, a leaky dam, and it feels like really a natural flood management presentation wouldn't be complete if there wasn't a picture of a leaky dam. By no means will this be the only one. Um, but what you can see here is a structure that is biomimicking the natural world. So it's something that's been put in, put in place by, by people, by us, um, that a beaver would have done pre-16th century um, to try and hold water in the landscape. And you can see it's changing channel levels and creating storage um, upstream of, of this particular structure. But natural flood management isn't just about one structure, it's about really a joined up holistic approach across catchments. So what we cover in the next 45 minutes, um, I will outline what is natural flood management. Um, I'll do my best to go beyond the very boring definitions that some of you may have come across in um, maybe um, things like the Environment Agency Evidence Directory or Super NFM Handbook. Um, and I'll try and draw some of those um, terms that are used often interchangeably um, about natural flood management together as well. Um, I'll initially outline what we currently know about natural flood management, and I'll take very much flood risk management leaning um, to, to this part and really the majority of this talk. Um, as Sue mentioned, the back, my background is in flood risk. Uh, before natural flood management, um, I was involved quite heavily within SUDS um, with lead local flood authorities. Um, and really natural flood management um, has a host of other multiple benefits, ecosystem services that um, can be associated with delivering these sorts of schemes. Um, and again, when it comes to uh, understanding further research projects, um, it's something worth exploring. But certainly for this presentation, I'll very much be covering the, the sort of flood risk leaning of, of natural flood management. Much more interestingly, I'll outline what we don't know about NFM. Um, now, it's not that the, um, there's a, an absence of evidence, um, that, you know, meaning that it, it, we can't explore these things, but rather actually the absence of evidence encourages us to explore further research potential. Um, and that's what I'd like to explore in, in this section of the presentation. I'll refer to these in terms of challenging uh, challenges and ongoing research projects um, that, are, that are underway, that I'm involved in um, as, as well. 
And then lastly, and I think most importantly, because there's um, not too many of us on this call, um, hopefully some Q&A time to discuss any interdisciplinary partnership potential. Um, natural flood management um, often is discussed in the realm of the natural sciences because the, the focus very much on flood risk is understanding fundamental processes. But actually to deliver these schemes, to understand their long term management and maintenance and any changes that are needed in terms of um, the, the adaptation of these structures is very much on the social sciences spectrum. Uh, and that's what I'll be drawing on within this presentation as well. So um, any any social scientists that I see uh, uh, that are on this call. So I know Jan was here, one of my PhD supervisors. Um, please do feel free to uh, to. To, to pipe up with lots of ideas and uh, um, potential questions to um, to how we could address some of these critical evidence gaps. So as I mentioned at the start, NFM, it's in the news, it's everywhere. It really is ubiquitous, pre-global pandemic. You wouldn't see an article in The Guardian um, or in BBC News that didn't somehow draw in natural flood management. Um, you can see there in the top left. Thank you, Greta, for um, encouraging UK government to explore nature-based solutions. Um, a couple there that um, live uh, in the Holnacott area, which was one of the early DEFRA multi-objective pilot projects way back in 2000 um, to explore natural flood management from the source to sea approach that believe natural flood management um, actually helped protect their homes. Uh, and there was some early evidence to suggest it did just that. Beavers, we always see beavers in the news, particularly when it comes to encouraging restoration of habitats and encouraging reintroduction of species. Beavers are our natural river engineers, and it's something that um, is closely linked to NFM that I'll also be drawing on throughout this talk. Um, and there's been lots of money for natural flood management. Um, Anyone from maybe a flood risk community at the minute that's listening may argue actually there's not enough. Um, but in, in terms of of central government investment into natural flood management. Um, there has been very early on a 15 million pound um, investment into lots of different natural flood management schemes, one of which was the one I worked on in my PhD. Um, but since then, there are also some promising funding initiatives that are coming with new policies, uh, particularly uh, the Environment Bill and the Agriculture Act um, in the form of ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme. Um, so. Uh, People particularly interested in the agricultural sector um, on this talk, very interest, interested to know your thoughts about um, any synergies between natural flood management and how that can sort of dovetail with the, the aims of, of ELMS. So, as I mentioned, there's been really an impetus for natural flood management, um, but not just from the news, actually from policy. Uh, and what you can see here is really hopefully a collection of policies that is in some vague timeline that are starting to funnel to, to come together to really drive the importance of natural flood management. Um, we could argue it goes right back to things like the Habitats Directive in 92 um, or the, the EU eel regulation um, of 2007, the Water Framework Directive of 2000 that encouraged management of things like diffuse pollution pathways and diffuse overland flows. Um, or things like the birds directors for encouraging habitat provision and improvement of biodiversity and restoration of our of our landscapes. Um, as we go down this funnel and we go to things like the floods directive and the flood and water management Act, uh, that really starts to specify uh, the importance of taking a more holistic catchment based approach to managing um, flood risk. So as a result of the floods directive, we have things like river basin management plans and from the Flood and Water Management Act. And when we look at the devolved authorities, so when you look at Scotland, they had the Flood Risk Management Act um, in 2009 that actually specified the exploration of natural flood management within the policy as well. Um, we've then had the DEFRA 25 year environment plan. And as I mentioned earlier, the Agriculture Act and Environment Bill um, that have a very much leaning towards payment for public good um, in terms of benefits we can obtain from our, um, our agricultural landscape. Uh, agricultural land accounts for around 70% of UK land coverage. And so it's incredibly important when it comes to managing sources and pathways of floodwaters. It's a massive area of, of land that we really can't ignore. So how has this, this policy impetus changed over time? Well, if I can um, outline it in terms of um, an image from a peat bog, um, this 
is an example of a very intensively drained peat bog. And arguably, it's been this way since the 1600s. Um, Cornelius Vermoyden introduced the devastating practice of land, re uh, land reclamation uh, way back when um, to encourage those areas that were naturally sponges in our landscape and sequestering carbon and providing habitat and all the other fantastic ecosystem services to support local communities in those areas um, to intensively drain them so they could be farmed. Um, and these were really and, and are still unfortunately common across uh, many areas of, of peatland um, internationally. But there is this transition now to see how we can hold water back in that landscape and restore some of these uh, natural regulatory functions of catchments. And so here we've actually have some grip blocks as they're known uh, to try and fill in these gullies that have been sending water off the landscape at a rapid rate um, and also planting things like sphagnum moss. Uh, so encouraging the peatland to green up again, uh, all of which raises water table and encourages that, that natural store of water in the landscape but peatlands are, of course, just one type of ecosystem and natural flood management aims to work across a real myriad, a real plethora of them. So what is natural flood management? Uh, so those of you that have come across natural flood management before, this um, sort of schematic of a catchment um, will be familiar to many of you. This is from the Environment Agency Evidence Directory, uh, put together by Lydia Burgess-Gamble and her team in 2018. Um, there is actually a an updated version coming out imminently, I believe, uh, but the definition given within this evidence directory that collated lots of different disparate case studies that were all around the world um, regarding natural flood management, tried to define it as measures that aim to protect, restore, and emulate the natural regulatory functions of our catchments. So as I said in that last slide, trying to encourage our catchments to really look after themselves um, and really a form of biomimicry to try and um, really kickstart what could be a recovery in that particular area. So, if, for example, where you have straightened watercourses, trying to encourage re-meandering, um, where you have a wetland that have been disconnected by levees, trying to remove those levees and encourage that floodplain and wetland to become inundated, where you have extensive areas um, of land that were once woodland, that have been removed, trying to reforest that area. So reforestation, tree planting, um, maybe across slopes or across the entirety of, a, of, a, um, of an upstream catchment area or within a floodplain or adjacent to a watercourse to increase roughness in that particular area. Leaky barriers, uh, really synonymous with natural flood management, the most widely adopted and, and arguably popular form of natural flood management um, because they're so simple in in really their application. Uh, they are lengths of timber, um, very simple structures uh, that are really often pleached, so still connected to bank, into a watercourse to try and slow the flow of water down through those pathways. But there's also headwater drainage. So when we look at water out of the channel, so before um, water gets to these leaky barriers, we have things like runoff attenuation features. So buns, uh, gully blocks that I refer to um, in, 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 in peatlands. Uh, here is an example of a, a, a bun type structure as well that's managing a runoff pathway. Um, and as we go further down, um, we can also start to explore um, wider scale soil and land management changes. Now, this is arguably the broadest category within um, the, the Environment Agency Evidence Directory for natural flood management, because it really encompasses so many and different forms of land management and soil husbandry um, that farmers could employ. Um, and when I refer to, um, to soil husbandry, it's obviously methods to try and encourage um, the accumulation of things like organic matter in our soil, to encourage infiltration, uh, to reduce the effects of things like compaction. Um, and this can include things like conservation tillage, uh, regenerative farming, um, maybe some of you have heard of as well. Um, all of which are trying to encourage the, the, the landscape to hold water, arguably as it did before uh, the first agricultural revolution within the UK and the, or, or arguably way back to early Neolithic farming 12,000 years ago. Um, but just a way of 
of really enabling um, the, the, so the soil to hold the water in the landscape. And actually, crucially, when it comes to, to farming, not losing that topsoil. Topsoil is an enormously valuable resource and we lose millions of it each year. And so a, a really a crucial and broad natural flood management category. And then lastly, the furthest downstream extent will be a coastal and estuarine natural flood management scheme. So think, thinking of um, uh, realignment of the coast um, to allow for intrusion of things like storm surges so it can dissipate that wave energy, salt marshes, mud, mud flats and, and so on. Now, when it comes to the, the et etymology of, of natural flood management, um, as, as Sue mentioned right at the start, um, Internationally, the term nature-based solutions is becoming much more prevalent as a term, uh, as a sort of catch-all term. But you may also come across terms like working with natural processes. Um, this catchment schematic is actually from the Working with Natural Processes Evidence Directory. There's also rural sustainable drainage systems. Uh, and this was um, something that is particularly prevalent in Scotland. Uh, they released a, a sort of design and build guide to rural sustainable drainage systems um, for Scottish farmers. Natural water retention measures, an approach that's used quite commonly uh, and, and a term rather that's used quite commonly in continental Europe. And there is a, a natural water retention measures mapping portal that you can access to see all these different sorts of schemes. Engineering with nature, unsurprisingly an American term, um, and then catchment based approach that. Um, that also incorporates natural flood management. But there are many others that, that, um, that aren't included that could also be um, terms that could fit under the natural flood management um, umbrella. Arguably, SUDS, you know, do, do we differentiate rural SUDS and SUDS? You know, is SUDS actually a, a form of natural flood management as well? But one thing I would like to outline is what natural flood management is not. And this is something that I've often had to say to farmers and communities, um, as well as um, people at conferences um, when, when they ask about natural flood management. Natural flood management is not King Canute trying to profess to his courtiers that he can control the tides um, in, in the 11th century, as you can see on the left hand side. Um, and many of farmers have called me King Canute for thinking that natural flood management could have a role in trying to slow, store, filter or disconnect flow pathways. Maybe it's the beard. I don't know. Um, but there is often this conception that natural flood management is this way of trying to um, control the natural world. And actually, it's a, a way of working with these natural processes, as was referred to in the land um, in the previous slide. What natural flood management is not as well, which is worth making clear. It is not permanently flooding farmers' fields. And this has uh, two crucial elements to, to that consideration. Um, permanently flooding farmers' fields would be largely unpopular with farmers, um, and therefore adoption would be very low. But also when it comes to performance, it's a crucial consideration because if we consider areas of land, uh, areas of land and, and farm holdings as storage units that we could hold in spate conditions during a flood event. If we are permanently holding water across an area of land and then we have a storm come through the system, we then have a reduced capacity across our catchments to hold temporarily that storm. And often that's what I say to farmers when it comes to natural flood management. It is not trying to, um, to create permanent lakes but rather create dry basins that you could still use for grazing. So you still could have sheep in the area, you could still have cattle and so on. You may even still cultivate. It may be a very gentle band that you cultivate over. Um, but in spate conditions, it then creates a temporary attenuation feature. Uh, but as I said at the start, NFM really is becoming increasingly popular. There has been a, a big policy impetus for NFM um, and also a, a lot of funding for, for natural flood management um, for lots of uh, pilot projects. Um, and I suppose it's hard to determine exactly how many projects constitute a pilot, but there's been lots of them. Um, in terms of um, U UK coverage of, of natural flood management schemes, there's a fantastic portal um, called the Working with Natural Processes Portal that's hosted by um, an ArcGIS online um, JBA map 
that you can then click around different projects. And you can see the two colors that identify the projects that are on the ground that have actually been delivered, um, and then projects that are in the planning or sort of feasibility scoping phase. And you can actually see there's an awful lot of projects that are on the ground, over 100 different NFM projects are on the ground. And within each of these dots, there'd be many more natural flood management schemes, because as I referred to in an earlier slide, natural flood management isn't just relying on one particular intervention, but appreciating actually it has to be a, a, a much larger um, holistic integrated approach across lots of them. And as I referred to earlier, the natural water retention measures is hosted by uh, the EU. Um, in terms of UK case studies, it's a little out of date. Uh, they've got some well-known ones, such as the Holnacott Source to Sea, the Belford runoff attenuation features, the Pickering scheme. Um, so uh, yeah, some, some well-known NFM schemes, uh, but they also have a fantastic source of uh, obviously case studies across Europe. Um, and uh, those of you that are from outside the UK, um, you know, nature-based solutions, natural water retention measures is arguably something that, um, that has been explored, you know, particularly when we go to Germany and Holland for, for years. You know, the Room for the River, uh, room for the river program, um, or in Germany saying, um, apologies for my German here, mehr Room for Fluss, more space for rivers. Yeah, that's a term that was used since 2002. Um, so, it's something that really has been um, has been around for quite some time, and within these case studies, you can click on them and also identify um, yeah, the, the associated performance of of these schemes as well, um, including um, further evidence gaps. So, example NFM measures in action. Um, if you don't mind, I always like showing NFM when it's holding water. I always think it looks much more exciting. Uh, so if I can take a source to sea approach with, with NFM, runoff attenuation features, things like buns. This is a bun from Belford, um, uh, really one of the earliest forms of runoff attenuation that was applied um, upstream of, of that community. The catchment itself was just over six square kilometres, so relatively small when it comes to NFM speak. Um, but a really ambitious scheme that that monitored the effects of um, holding water behind these these temporary storage features and you can't see it here but underneath this bund is a pipe and what this pipe enacts is something called Torricelli's flow through an orifice so when flow is so high that it is starting to throttle against the orifice of that pipe then it starts to back up and create storage and that's what's going on here this is during the, the peak of an event uh, and then it would subsequently drain. Offline storage very much works in a similar way to a bund, uh, but it requires a deflector from a river to divert flow into a depression within the floodplain. Um, now, many of you listening will say, well, if rivers are naturally encouraged to do that anyway with meandering, um, they will naturally connect to the landscape. As I said right at the start, NFM is biomimicry. So offline storage is just encouraging this process along. Um, and then the same process of just throttling the flow here, then having a spillway to encourage it back into the channel in a regulated slow manner. This is also from, from Belford. Reduced stocking density. Yeah, just a holiday snap. Uh, one um, picture on the right hand side shows um, obviously uh, more sheep in a particular field. With that, you have associated compaction issues, associated issues with um, overgrazing as well. So you're having less hydraulic roughness on the surface. Um, so you're reducing not only the ability to infiltrate, but also the, the ability of that field to then encourage evapotranspiration losses. Whereas reduced stocking density can enable obviously rougher vegetation, reduce compaction and so on. Uh, leaky barriers. Um, famous leaky barriers from Stroud, the Stroud Rural Sud Scheme, uh, you can see in low flow and high flow. Now what I want to make clear about leaky barriers is that when they're applied, often base flow is left unimpeded. And the reason for that, it, well, is, is twofold. Um, firstly, to actually encourage things like fish passage through these structures. Um, we don't want to create things like weirs, you know, as a, as, a, as a sector, the water sector has worked very hard to try and remove weirs and blockages uh, when it comes to things like meeting WFD status and so on. But in peak flows, it then changes the channel level. So acting almost like that bund where it starts to throttle um, at that gap at the bottom of the structure and then create storage above and also connecting to that floodplain. 
but then after that peak has passed, draining back down and flowing back through that structure. And then more ambitious projects. So here's the Edelson Water um, uh, re-meandering scheme with associated floodplain restoration. So on the left hand side here, this is actually the original, well, I say original, this was the straightened route of the water course. Um, but at some stage before it was straightened, it did meander. And so there was a re-meandering process to encourage floodplain re reconnection and restoration. Grass margins and buffers. Um, hopefully something that we all see across the agricultural landscape should really be a minimum of eight metres. But unfortunately, in some instances, these aren't maintained. And of course, when you don't have a margin, you can have associated runoff and pollutants that could go into the watercourse. Uh, but also, you don't have that hydraulic roughness associated with the bank and also the crest of the bank. So when the channel does rise, you're not getting that, that, that level of, of roughness. And then lastly, um, managed realignment when it goes to the sea, you know, coasts and estuaries. And this is the Med Mary scheme in Sussex, uh, the largest open managed realignment scheme um, uh, across Europe. And really um, an ambitious project that encouraged the sea to come inland. So not taking the sort of draconian approach of holding the line, but enabling water to ingress into, into, our, um, in, into our coast, into our estuaries, uh, creating fantastic habitat, um, but also a fantastic way of dissipating wave energy. And this particular scheme actually protects over 300 properties. So what is the approach to uh, flood risk management when you use natural flood management? Well, if I can outline this using a, um, an example hydrograph. So let's say pre-natural flood management, we have a, a rapid rise to, to peak. You know, it's a, a rapid response catchment um, and you know, it, the rising in goes up and drops down um, very quickly. And at a certain height of that river, and this is just an image from uh, York where there's been some flooding, uh, properties flood. So there's a threshold to which properties flood um, along, this, along this hydrograph. But let's say we look upstream of that community and we look at the entirety of the catchment and we take a targeted approach to put in attenuation ponds, so temporary storage attenuation ponds and sediment traps and so on. We look to slow water via hedgerows, so creating that almost sort of contour barrier where you might have some sheet runoff that, that comes off from the field. We could filter water, ideally even back into groundwater, um, through woodlands and so on to encourage the retention of water in the landscape, as well as many others. And hopefully by applying these, then post natural flood management, this is what we would like to see. So this is an attenuation of flood peak downstream um, at the community at risk. And what you can see here isn't so much lopping off that volume of water. Um, that is a reduction, reductionist approach to flood risk management, an approach that's been applied by engineers for years. If, if they're looking at designing a scheme, well, how much water is in the hydrograph? And let's just displace that in a big flood storage area nearby. But of course, that's costly and an over-reliance on one particular scheme. What natural flood management tries to do is, is take a much more sophisticated approach to re redistributing that water from the rising limb to the receding limb. And how we would note the performance of a natural flood management scheme is hopefully seeing a change in flood peak, a reduction in flood peak, I should have had uh, below a certain threshold, and also crucially, an increase in time to peak. And for anyone that's listening um, who is from a community at risk, Early warning and timing is essential in flood risk management. Uh, we have a, a, a very sophisticated early warning system really across the UK when it comes to river flooding, not so much from surface water flooding. Um, but this particular system, uh, still in some instances in rapid response catchments, can leave people with less than an hour to start moving belongings and furniture and so on upstairs if we get a really intense storm. Um, so having that that delayed time to peak can also provide more time um, to take the associated precautions that are needed but something worth bearing in mind with natural flood management particularly from a um a, a modeling um perspective when you're looking at a very large catchment scales let's say this sort of balloon type image uh, is a is a large catchment area and the red sort of sub catchment area is an area that's had some natural flood management put in. 
Now the blue line, this blue hydrograph, could indicate the response in this particular area where there hasn't been any natural flood management put in. So this could be the uh, recorded at the outflow at the green dot. However, if we then put in natural flood management, we might find that it converges and meets in this particular location this other subcatchment. And so what we can have is a convergence of flood peaks, also known as synchronization of peaks, which can actually make the problem worse. Uh, now, this is something that I should add is very hard to identify through observed data. So you'd have to have a, a really detailed uh, observed network of gauges to, to both space modic rainfall and space to space modic spatially variable flow patterns to pick this up. But from models, it is possible. Uh, and particularly in Newcastle University, they, they use something called the flood impact modeling tool uh, to identify these possible um, scenarios. So what do we know about natural flood management? Um, well, we know where we can situate natural flood management um, and a, a really ambitious project um, partnership with JBA and um, the Environment Agency uh, was actually looking at making a national um, natural flood management opportunity map portal that you could dip into. And there were tiers to the mapping portal and you could go right down to the water body catchment map. So based on the Environment Agency um, water body classification codes, you could then identify uh, possible opportunities. And what I'd like to do now actually is quickly show you um, what this looks like. So this is just the mapping portal for for, for JBA um, on opportunities. It's actually the same portal that identifies uh, projects on the ground and also uh, plans or, um, or feasibility studies. But if I start, if I zoom into Coventry and click through these areas of potential, we can see here additional floodplain woodland. So you can see here um, within the allotments, potentially floodplain woodland that's being recommended. Riparian woodland, so that's uh, woodland adjacent to the watercourse in a similar area. Additional catchment woodland, so that's looking at planting outside of the floodplain in larger areas. Enhanced floodplain reconnection, so if I turn off the woodland layers now, and you can see here some areas they've recommended some enhanced floodplain reconnection. Runoff attenuation features, um, so things like buns and offline ponds to temporarily store water. But this is provided for the one in 30 annual probability flows. So the 3.3% annual exceedance probability uh, flood event. And then here um, for the one in 100 annual probability flows. So you probably find them hard to see. So if I zoom in a bit more in this map, you can then hopefully identify some, some of these high level opportunities. But what is important to note is that they are very high level. And even just on this particular layer, so the one in 100, the 1% 1 annual exceedance probability runoff attenuation feature opportunity, that already looks like within the golf course, a water feature. So it's worth bearing in mind that this um, very ambitious mapping um, scope of high level opportunities, and by no means are these exhaustive, these, yeah, there's are lots of other opportunities that aren't considered within this mapping portal, have not considered uh, on the ground feasibility, particularly input from landowners and farmers that are crucial when it comes for natural um, flood management adoption. Because this process was really done entirely with mostly open access data on a desk based level. So this is just a data flow diagram that indicates the sorts of data sets that were used, um, processing such as allocating buffers, um, adding classes and weightings um, to then consider um, where possible features could be. There's been some more localized opportunity mapping works uh, from, from smaller consultancies. An example is actually 2B Landscape Consultancy up in uh, Calderdale or Slow the Flow. So they actually looked at NFM and SUDS opportunities across this area. Um, so if I can go um, back to this, this web link, so here you can see an example of something that's hosted on Google Earth. So both are open access tools um, and you can click around subcatchments. Um, not a good example, there's no image of that one. And it will identify um, possible opportunities within this area. So there's a picture, um, suggested interventions, 
estimated volume of water that could be held and some notes. Incredibly high level. Um, and again, with this process, uh, doesn't really account for the local input um, to understand sort of on the ground feasibility of, of a scheme. Another example of a high level scoping project that's a, a lot closer to home um, was done by Viridian Logic um, on NFM suitability mapping for a host of ecosystem services um, uh, yeah, across the upstream extent of Falongli. Uh, so very, very close to Coventry. And they looked at wetland restoration, reforestation and grassland re uh, revegetation. So again, not an exhaustive list of opportunities. And hopefully, again, you can see very high level. So it's looking at a, a suitability map based on desk based data without any on the ground engagement with farmers and landowners. So if I can then refer to my own work, um, this really seemed a very big evidence gap when it came to natural flood management. There was a, a, a huge focus on providing these desk based tools, almost decision support tools to uh, facilitate this this level of, um, sort of high level understanding of natural flood management opportunities. But not really considering the most, I would argue, the most essential stakeholders, the farms and landowners that would have to permit and potentially um, own and, and manage and maintain these structures. And so the participatory GIS approach I used to co-design natural flood manage, management opportunities um, were, were fivefold. Um, there was an introductory process um, with a very supportive local flood action group, as well as gatekeepers such as Natural England. Um, that already had contacts with with these uh, with these farms and landowners. There was then an outline of the project um, to actually obtain consent um, to then um, work through the the participatory GIS with, with them. So to the co-design process, they were then provided with bespoke farm information packs, and these bespoke farm information packs were really there just to give an understanding of not necessarily what could be done just an understanding of their farm from a physical, hydrological and social characteristics perspective from desk-based data. So stuff that I could do sitting behind a laptop um, for a number of hours collating data sets and layers together in, in GIS. So looking at things like overland pathways, hydrological connectivity. So this is a, just a schematic in the top right hand corner of um, uh, hydrological connectivity across a digital terrain model. So very simply understanding what areas of land have a propensity to then generate and then convey water you know, down, downhill and eventually into a receiving water course. And then there was a process of actually conducting the participatory GIS exercise. So identifying problem areas and then obtaining some feedback from the, the farmer that said, well, yeah, I appreciate there's an overland flow route there, but this is you know, my, my best sheep field, and I don't really want to take the sheep off this, off this land. And then through that, a feedback mechanism to then work through possible opportunities that could work in different areas before a final confirmation was obtained. And if I can just outline um, this in terms of uh, a, a pilot farm. Uh, so uh, here is just the pilot farm to identify um, those flood resources and pathways uh, through desk-based data sets. So the risk of flooding from surface water data sets to, to different size storms, as well as the risk of flooding from sea, uh, rivers and sea layer to identify areas of out of bank flow from a channel. What was also obtained was um, knowledge from the farmer themselves. Um, now, we can think of farmers as passive custodians of, of land, but we can actually think of them as active participants in making these sorts of environmental decisions. And, and this is the approach that was taken in this research to co-produce knowledge on flood resources and pathways. So farmers would employ often those sort of tactile memories of where their overland flows. They may have some picture evidence um, to then incorporate um, into this decision making process. And then as a result of identifying key overland pathways, so on the on the previous uh, image you can hear, we've got a dominant overland flow pathway that comes down through what is a valley, um, overtopping existing ponds uh, before going into the watercourse. It was then recognised that some features could then be applied in order to um, slow flow uh, in those particular areas. And also um, they were features that the farmer was happy to explore. And so when it comes to uh, further modelling, 
you're actually modeling what is a feasible scenario instead of a high level scenario that's been entirely desk based without understanding any local buy in. And this actually encouraged um, implementation as well. So this early farmer engagement um, allowed for, for adoption. And here is actually the, the bund. Um, you could see here this runoff attenuation bund um, with some water in it. Um, this looks like a big muddy pile because this was taken not long after uh, construction, but um, it's grass seeded now and all established. Um, and here things like leaky barriers, um, so you know, certain parts of the channel that a farmer was happy to have um, a, a leaky barrier, um, then that could 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 be um, could be implemented. What I would like to stress, of course, is that it is not putting in F NFM and then sacrificing the ability to collect evidence. Um, the approach that was adopted here actually was. Uh, putting these in with an ongoing uh, before after control impact monitoring program to inform whole life costs as well as whole life benefits of, of natural flood management. Um, but I'll be discussing this in more detail later. So natural flood management performance in terms of a, a modeling perspective. So we know where we can put it. There are different methods to suggest where we can put it, but we have an idea of where we can situate natural flood management. Um, now, this is a schematic diagram that shows the relative effects of catchment scale interventions from Simon Dadson and the team at Oxford, um, their natural flood management restatement back in 2017. Now, this um, sort of schematic that shows different types of NFM in relation to their flood magnitude effects and reduction in flood peak um, really found that the larger the catchment and the larger the flood, the smaller the scope for actually slowing the flood or actually storing flood water to reduce that particular flood hazard. And this restatement really um, had the main had had four main conclusions. First, the interventions that increase the ability of soils to absorb and retain water through changes to land cover and land management were considered the most effective in smaller events at smaller hydrological scales, so really no larger than 10 square kilometers. Once soils become very saturated, the effects were really quite hard to notice, particularly from um, hydrological models. Uh, so once you have those saturation excess overland flows, the capacity of that, that soil obviously has been exceeded. There, there's no additional capacity to hold water there. Uh, storage. Um, storage from things like distributed runoff attenuation features, um, natural floodplains and, and wetlands, even larger detention basins uh, can be effective in reducing flood risk, depending on how much storage is actually provided and where it's located and also how and when it's used. So if, yeah, if we think about a runoff attenuation feature, think trying to get that to become active at the right time. So uh, not, as I say, not permanently holding water for very small rainfall events, that could then lead to the capacity of that feature being exceeded and then having this sort of burst effect and an overtopping effect. And then lastly, increasing the cross-sectional area of floodplains by setting back things like levees and defences that have historically disconnected the floodplain um, was identified to reduce peak river flows and flood water levels. What I'd like to do now is take you through some examples of, of some NFM modelling studies, and I'll take you through uh, method, different methods of modelling as well, because this is really important to note when it comes to natural flood management. There is no one um, recommended method for modelling natural flood management. Much like the application of these interventions, it is often based on the, the area that you're studying. Um, so if I can go to Poland first and foremost, um, in the upper Nisa Szalona, uh, catchment um, at 23.1 square kilometres, so a, a reach scale model study using um, HECRAS in a 1D model. Um, the hydraulic roughness of the channel was significantly increased um, under a scenario to look at changing channel morphology and increasing riparian vegetation. Uh, and this, the study that was uh, conducted by Kistria Town in 2012 um, also did some some ground-based uh, surveying to inform the cross-selection area, as well as the associated roughness values that could be used um, for, um, for this particular scheme. Now, the resulting water velocities for a 100-year 
return period, so a 1% annual exceedance probability event, was 41% lower um, than those of a, a channelized, um, sort of heavily modified water body with no established riparian vegetation, which is suggesting that actually the restoration of both channels and the river banks and that sort of marginal um, habitats that we see when it comes to, to rivers um, could actually slow down the passage of floodways through the network. Uh, a, a slightly bigger study that wasn't just a one-dimensional model, an in-channel model, but also um, included the, the two-dimensional uh, environment, so outside of the uh, river network, was the Debenham um, modelling study. And um, the Debenham study uh, used JFLOW, which is a JBA modelling tool, um, as well as Flood Modeler, um, to look at the effects of 10 natural flood management attenuation features uh, across a, around 34 square kilometer catchment. Now, um, I should stress that these 10 features were, were actually based on the JBA NFM opportunity mapping tools and, uh, and were very high level. So they weren't feasible um, in terms of, of farmer buy-in. They were um, at just a high level uh, consideration of what could be put where. But this particular uh, modeled study identified that, uh, um, that there was actually 34,250 cubic metres of storage provided across the three subcatchments. So the Cherry Tree Brook, the Derry Brook, and this one here, the Gulls and the Aspal Drain. Um, that actually managed to reduce damage to properties by 31%, uh, based on the um, looking at the change in the baseline scenario to the NFM scenario across a, a number of, of return periods. Um, and actually for the one in 75 year flood, so the 1.3% annual exceedance probability, um, the model suggested that it can actually reduce total property damages by £421,400. And this is based on something called the multicolored manual um, calculation of costs associated with depths of damages uh, to properties. And a, a really exciting model project that's um, that's underway um, and is due to be complete July of next year um, is the QNFM scheme um, from Lancaster. And it's actually looking at um, modelling NFM along with observed data and also conducting ense uh, ensemble modelling. So not just having a deterministic one scenario tested, but for those modelers that are that are listening, trying to better understand uncertainty and confidence with your models by running lots and lots of models. And this is mainly done through Dynamic Top Model, which is um, an R package. And these are some of the outputs that you can see here um, that identify, um, say, lots of different scenarios comparing baseline to intervention, uh, and then understanding the shift from a, a baseline scenario to an intervention scenario to understand changing flood peak and so on. But the observed data they, they're using uh, is mainly based on flow data as well as space modic rainfall inputs as well. So, of course, there are lots of different parameters that influence river response. Um, variable infiltration, variable roughness, um, vari uh, variable evapotranspiration losses, all that can occur across a hill slope. But actually, when it comes to uh, understanding um, the change in, in response for um, calibrating a flood model, um, river flow is, is really a fantastic gold standard that you could use. And that's what they're doing here. So you can see we've got a telemetered gauge um, with a sort of a weir plate that's used to create a sort of more uniform flow to then identify from a before after control impact perspective um, how, the, how the flows are and obviously calibrating the model to those observed flows. And again, the, the scenarios that were tested here were based on these high level JBA and FM opportunity maps. Now, something they are exploring here, but it's a much later part of, of this, this NERC funded scheme, um, is also exploring the, the levels of farmer engagement as well. And that's been managed by the Rivers Trust. But this is something that was done very much later on in the, in the project, not earlier on. And so it, it may be that 
certain um, farmers through a workshop identify that they don't want to explore peat restoration or uh, flood, uh, floodplain woodland that were modelled. And of course, those scenarios would have to be have to be um, have to be remodelled. So that's what we know about NFM. But if I can go on to the much more exciting content of what we don't know about natural flood management, and if I can refer to a project that I'm closely involved in um, across South Warwickshire, um, and this is particularly looking at how we can gather and upscale observe natural flood management performance. And this is particularly at the very large hydrological scales to large and in some instances, double peak storms. So in lots of flood models, your inflow would just be one single peak through the system. But in the real world, we know rainfall patterns are, aren't homogenous. You don't just get this consistent um, hyetograph. You, you would have, as I say, these potential double peak storms. And so here is um, an ArcGIS Online map to show you all of the different interventions that have gone in in accordance with um, this before or after control impact program. But linked to this is a natural flood management projects monitoring and evaluation portal that you can uh, record the condition of assets um, as well as in event based circumstances, identifying what they're doing. And, and thankfully, this fantastic group of, of, uh, of a local community flood action group were able to go out during an event and capture that data. Now, whilst it may seem very qualitative, just going and taking pictures and rather anecdotal, they're also recording things like stage board information. So, you know, how high the river is downstream of certain schemes and comparing that to a comparable storm event. But there's also some instrumentation across the catchment, instrumentation of individual features, as well as instrumentation of uh, channels in a, um, in a, say, a backy approach. Um, so using things like pressure transducers to understand the change in level over time. And I appreciate I've said back here a number of times. This is actually a schematic that shows the the high level approach of, of sort of before after control impact monitoring. So you across, let's say, a, a, a 10 square kilometer sub catchment, there may be two tributaries, um, one at, that are comparable uh, in both their land coverage, the geological characteristics, the change in topography, change in elevation, and also the maybe the, the strata ordering. So the, the, the size of that channel and so on. And within those, you can compare changing rainfall patterns, have inflows and outflows that's being explored, but also baseline before the uh, interventions went in. And this is an ongoing uh, piece of work. And uh, I've had some students as well helping me out with this one. So doing a bit of the number crunching uh, to try and understand how we can upscale some of these local scale performances to the entirety of the catchment scale, which is 187 square kilometers. So using uh, localized observed data to understand performance at the large catchment scale. But linked to that previous slide, it's also important to quantify whole life benefits and whole life costs. So natural flood management mimics that natural world, but the natural world changes. It's important to understand that things like ecological succession, um, so, if let's say we have a leaky barrier and that accumulates more debris over time, does that create a larger structure that could then improve the performance or you restore a river and that associated uh, floodplain habitat starts to establish and increases roughness in the floodplain? Does that increase performance over time? Um, another really crucial evidence gap, particularly for uh, farmers and landowners, is maintenance considerations. So do certain features need regular monitoring and maintenance to actually sustain performance. So if there is a bund and it's silting up continuously, then of course that could reduce the capacity of that structure. Um, but who bears responsibility for maintaining that particular structure? Is it the farmer or is it an agency or is it a local group? These are really challenging questions that um, really transcend not just the natural sciences, but very much into the social sciences. And also it's important to better understand and quantify where possible the value of interlinked, um, the interlinked nature of natural flood management's multiple benefits. The Environment Agency Evidence Directory did that to some extent uh, with a benefits will, but this was again very high level. And also some work with colleagues uh, Joe Hart and Matteo um, and um, yeah, and myself uh, looking at um, the effects of different levels of blockages in a leaky barrier, um, simulating a leaky barrier within a flume. Um, so a physical simulation, if you like. 
Governance, another crucial evidence gap when it comes to natural flood management, and particularly how we use farmers and landowners. As I referred to earlier, are they passive custodians? Do we use high level maps that have been produced by consultancies and so on to advise what should be done? Or do we use them as active partners? And I like to think of this in terms of a chicken and egg argument. Um, do we um, use the argument that the model suggests what could work and, and that's what we should do? Or do we go to the farmer first and determine what is acceptable and then model those scenarios? The likelihood is we have to be somewhere in between. And, um, and from a policy and future funding perspective of natural flood management, um, you know, obviously you're all aware of, of ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, that's um, as a result of, say, the Environment and Agricultural Act. And there are tiers to uh, ELMS, uh, tier three being the most ambitious with you know, wider restoration of things like peatlands and, and wider areas of reforestation and so on. And these will be payments for public good. So it all sounds very exciting, but a lot of flood risk is actually funded through a traditional grant and aid process. So based on a weight of evidence showing that it's worth investing in natural flood management um, and using guidances like um, the multicolored manual, as well as something called the partnership funding calculator that is an in-house tool that's used by the environment agency, they can then try and determine if something's worth exploring and then funding it. Because of course, you don't want to spend money on a scheme that doesn't work. But how do the two dovetail? How can we try and fund natural flood management that works? Um, but of course, also recognizing that it's an incredibly complex and distributed approach to managing our catchments. You know, and, and how much weight of evidence do we need before we um, before we embark on the schemes? And really, this, if I can just use another metaphor, this is really considering how we um, how we approach farmers and landowners when it comes to employing natural flood management? Do we take a carrot or stick approach? Um, I think with certain approaches um, in, in CAP, particularly with pillar two payments in CAP, there was a quite a hefty stick if farmers failed to um, meet the requirements as set out by their stewardship arrangements when you look at things like countryside stewardship agreements. Um, but there were also huge carrot incentives, huge financial incentives for farmers to also do uh, things like environmental betterment. And it seems like this is the approach Elms is looking to take. Um, it's in very much the pilot stage at the minute. Um, but as of uh, later in 2024, Elms is it will be the, the new approach for, for funding um, payment for public good options across the agricultural landscape. And, and lastly, um, a, a bit of a depressing thought, really. We have to acknowledge that the climate at our catchments are changing. Uh, the climate is changing in a rather scary and rapid rate, particularly with uh, you know, uh, our rainfall intensity and subsequent peak river flow. Uh, you know, particularly, yeah, if we look at very extreme scenarios based on the UK climate change projections in 2018, so the the high, the high, very high scenarios. Uh, we could be going as much as 90% um, increase in peak river flow. Um, so these are very scary figures, but we're also subject to potential drought risk, as well as increasing urban extent. Uh, this was found in, in areas um, particularly to the north and, and Wales. So how does NFM fit into this changing catchment? You know, is it just a sticking plaster or can it be used in a much more holistic integrated approach? Great. Uh, that's all from me. Fo Apologies I ran over, folks, but that's all from me. Thank you very much.